for the last couple of months, I've been playing with different SaaS tools. I'm playing with SaaS tools because part of my job and part of my actually interest is how to secure code in uh, the best way. And uh, doing so, we always uh, start by uh, playing with SaaS. After SaaS, uh, there are much more IaaS than Dust, but this talk will will focus about static tools and uh, I try to play with them and abuse them in different ways and I will show you how. So who am I? I'm Rotem, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm the head of marketplace at Cytos Security. It's a startup I joined uh, a few months ago. But more important, I'm a bug bounty researcher. I play with lots of, uh, with lots of different programs uh, over the years uh, and I'm a cyber paladin for the last uh, 20 years now. So I started my infosec career 20 years ago and uh, I'm just playing around with different from application testing to infrastructure testing to developing uh, different SaaS tools and now playing and abusing uh, SaaS tools. Uh, and I will show you what, I, what I've done. So first of all, who is my target audience? So I'm targeting different type of people and I think this will interest also security engineers who want to fix problems and uh, to, tell other problem, uh, to tell other people where they have gone wrong. I'm targeting DevOps people because they are in charge of large scale de deployments and every day we have more and more automation and more, of, uh, more uh, automated uh, deployments uh, going out every day. Uh, SAST builders, of course, it's a uh, different, like this talk is about SAST, so I'm targeting uh, you guys. And uh, a bit of bad guys, people who have decided to harm other people for a living. I hope none are in the audience here, but if you are, please go to the good side and start helping people. So a bit about what I will be talking about, it's SAST how it works. I'm going to give a brief intro about how everything is, uh, works and why I started this research. I will show a bit the hacking and uh, what I've done. And I will wrap up with uh, different conclusions and what is the impact of all of this. So SAST 101. What is SAST? SAST is Static Application Security Testing. This, is, this means that we are testing applications in a static manner. So I went to Wikipedia and Wikipedia says it very, very easy that static program analysis is the analysis of co computer software that is performed without actually executing any programs. So, and this is very important because static analysis can, can happen on different targets with different types of trust and we don't want to execute any programs. Let's say that we have different fuzzles that do execute programs in the sandbox environments, but SAS is supposed not to, not to execute nothing. So why do we run SAS? It stop, the first thing is to stop bad security practices. We want to make sure that nobody inserts a bad code into our, um, uh, into our organization. We want to prevent infrastructure and mistakes. So now we have lots of infrastructure as code. Uh, we want to assess code. So if we have like a big security test, sometimes I will run a bunch of say, SAS tools to check the code. And I want to create standardization and uh, consistency across lots of uh, codes. So let's say we want, say there's no evil in our code, we can create a rule, no evil, and we run it and, uh, uh, and it would be standardized. Uh, so why SAS? And we have different pros and VS cons, but the pros, it's very fast. It can run on code, different SAS have different like, times, but it's much faster than Dust and much faster than other uh, fuzzing and highest uh, solutions. It's safe, it doesn't, not, it doesn't execute any code. And it's easy, 
we can run the, on the code. We usually don't need any other resources. Sometimes we have imports and stuff like that, but it's uh, usually it's inside the same code base and we don't need external resources for it. Um, about the cons, we have lots of false positives. Like SAS can do as much as uh, looking at the code, but it doesn't know what's the logic and it doesn't know how it is used. Uh, it's very hard to track uh, flow control. So if you have lots of complex uh, flows, SAS will be a nightmare over here. Um, but not why uh, SAS, but how do they work? How does the scanners uh, work exactly? So first of all, the scanners take the code, they parse the code and they look for different, let's say JavaScript. So they look for JavaScript files and then they start converting these JavaScript text files into AST structures. AST is a structure of uh, how to template code uh, in a way we can process it later. So after we create this AST and I will show you later how, how it looks like, we start processing it. When we process the code, we just look for a, in the basic, we have different rules and different uh, findings we want to look for. And in the more complex AST, we have flow control analysis and we start looking for sources and sinks. But then we have all the results and we create a result based uh, SAS. Usually today we have Sarif, it's a very fun format uh, that uh, lots of tools are starting to adapt. And uh, we are working with this and we are creating uh, the results so other systems can consume them. Let's take an example. If we have a log one plus two times three. It's a very simple function that does a arithmetic uh, comparison. And how does it look like in AST? So first of all, if we look at the binary of the, the tree, so we see the program, it's uh, calling uh, the, the expression, the call expression is log. It has a plus expression and then there's a split, like one. And because times is before plus, and this is a uh, basic math. So we have a split over there and then there's the two, and uh, three. Sometimes these uh, ASTs are by ANTLR. It's like a um, destructuring tokenizer uh, language or by other means. Uh, it doesn't matter how it, how it created it, but then it creates this tree. From this tree, we can create a JSON or a XML or a however we want to represent it. But we are creating the data that we can start looking up on it. So let's say we have here a call expression and the identifier again with a call and arguments and you can see the binary expression. So now we can start walking the tree and start understanding what's happening over here. If we take a basic rule, let's say we want that if this is a call expression and we have a log and the length is uh, above zero, we have arguments, then we can say there's a log function with uh, more than one argument. It can get complex. We can have more very flow control and uh, very complex uh, architectures. So let's say we have this if and then, and all this goes into a variable that we call source, so we tag it as a source. And then we create an, another argument, another uh, lookup for uh, sinks. And we can buy, if we're using Neo4j or some other graph database, we can start connecting sinks and source and uh, seeing the whole trace. And then if there's a trace, we can report the finding. So it can get very complex and uh, very fast. And this is why, uh, but still it's very functional. It's very static. There's no, uh, we never execute the code. So as Wikipedia said, it really doesn't execute the code. We don't have any execution over here and uh, we are all good to go and we can start using the SAS to assess even the most malicious uh, programs and malicious code uh, areas. So my hypothesis and my question was, was what if I could write code that will intentionally abuse a scanner 
one scanned, one statically scanned. So this means, can I create a method or a way with these areas uh, to do to change the behavior of the scanner, to abuse it or change it? Or so I, I looked up at different uh, previous researchers, and we had in the past there was a check of remote code execution. It was fixed, and uh, check of two when they created it someone could create a malicious telephone file and with this telephone file it could execute code inside Chekhov and when executing the code it had access to the whole environment of uh, where it was executed and there was a very simple check a workaround do not run Chekhov on telephone files from untrusted sources or pull requests but I want to run Chekhov on untrusted sources this is why I'm doing it so it's a bit a bit of a mix. So they fixed it, and now now I feel uh, I'm I'm okay, and I can run run again check up. Uh, a bit. I was playing with. Uh, it was a lintel, but you can use it also as a SAS. Uh, uh, it's a closure lintel that you can use also as a SAS tool and create different types of rules. And I will expand ab about it a bit later, but. I opened a bug about it that it actually evaluates code. I will show you exactly what it does and how how it does it. But in the comment, I got I talked with uh, the guy over there, and they said, "Okay, but this is how the scanner works, and we have nothing to do about it. Maybe add documentation." So I'm looking at Terraform. And Terraform is actually it's not a SAS. I know but we do have different SAS scanners like Snake or Telescan that do rely on the telephone plan. So one of the recommendations inside CICD environments is before running like Snake IAC is to create a TF plan and they show here in the documentation run telephone plan and then telephone show. So we have Terraform, Terraform has a plan and then apply. And in the apply, it does actually do stuff with the, the environment and executes code, but the plan shouldn't do anything malicious. But then we had uh, Hiroki Sueza is uh, someone I talked with in one of the cloud forums. And he pointed that actually Terraform plan can run code. It has a, you can create a telephone provider exec and you can run code with it. So if you're running any SAS that is relying on telephone plan and you're doing telephone plan before, as a step before the SAS, then you should know that someone can create a provider and you can create even an unofficial provider that will download it from a HTTP server. And, um, and execute. So you can see also Alex Cascaso has a, a created a, a very nice blog about it. Uh, but this is out there. So a bit of hacking time. And now we are going uh, coming into the fun stuff. But first I want to have a small disclaimer. I believe in open source and I think that it may, makes the world secure and it makes our life easier with open source but we need to use it responsibly because open source is not a full-blown commercial tool it didn't have the years of uh, uh, development and years of uh, and lots of clients uh, maybe it did, did have lots of clients but it doesn't have enough resources uh, to always to be in the best security maturity level and we need to understand this because when we use open source and it's very i believe in using it but we need to make sure that we run it and we treat it as something that is not like is not fully baked or is not like some are more mature some are less mature and uh, we have to know about these areas 
and one of the parts of my mission and my what I want to do is to make sure that it will be safer and safer to use open source and in companies and in real life but for startups we have to make sure that we are running in a safe environment and that everything is configured and uh, we know how to configure it properly so that's about that but my experiment so my experiment is very simple i i looked at different scanners at different uh, scanners i collected um, uh, through my experience uh, and then i started looking at how they will execute or what what can i do with them and i created different kinds of evil files what is evil files i will show you in the experiments uh, now but i'm adding these evil files to the repo i'm letting the environment clone the repo and i'm assuming the the scanner will work in the same working directory as the repo cloned now this is a assumption based on different levels of knowledge of uh, in companies and they saw in, mo in lots of places the scanners are uh, running inside the same working directory as the repo and scanning themselves scanning the repo itself uh, then executing the scanner and I want to see what's the outcome what what can I do so experiment number one Chekhov before we had the RC on Chekhov and this is why I started looking at it and I started looking and in the documentation and I saw that Chekhov is actually running against you can run it against the directory against a working directory the same working directory or the home directory and when when you are running it against the directory it looks for a dot check of yml file to load it as a config file and this is interesting because it's actually how you how you need to work with Chekhov or with other sas tools uh, the sas tools assume there are different changes and different types of the levels of maturity inside the code and developers are able to skip rules and optimize uh, the each repo according to what they want to do but this means that also if i will take a repo i will scan it and i added the check of yml file into the repo I can say check none. I can give it a check none uh, file, and what will happen is that the checkoff will pick the configuration up if there's no default, if there's no forced configuration, and it's a big if. But, uh, but most or lots of places I saw don't have a uh, forced configuration, so it will actually not scan the code. It will give you uh, everything is okay and this is philosophy in a philosophical way a question if if this is how we should run code because we are giving the developer lots of permission and lots of uh, ability to to configure properly the what he wants to do but at the same time, we are giving him the permission to do nothing, to say, just skip it, let's bypass security uh, uh, altogether and just leave me alone. And this is a good question about how, what as a security team I should do. But let's look at a demo. And here I, we took TerraGoat. A TerraGoat is a, let's see if we can see it here. Uh, first thing doesn't work but we took TerraGoat. TerraGoat is a is a repo that has lots of problems uh, for Chekhov and you can see we have lots of failed checks uh, and uh, at the end the uh, echo this is a very important thing the um, the return code is one one means there was a problem and uh, if it was in a CI/CD environment uh, it would fail the build 
Now I'm echoing again the same thing, but I'm adding the bypass checks into dot check of YML and running again check of. Nothing. Everything is good. There, there are no errors, no nothing. The error code is zero. Everything is awesome. So this means with a very simple adding of the rule, adding of this file, we bypass the whole scanner configuration. So after we saw what we can do with Chekhov, I looked into different other tools and they all, as I say, though by definition or not all, but lots of them give you the same configuration, the same ability. They have a default configuration file. You can create it and then bypass or create different rules and we can see here PHP stand and TFSec and KICS and Bandit and Breakman and Chekhov and Samgrep uh, and I'm sure there are more that I didn't check. Uh, we have the default configuration and if you put this default configuration and tell them bypass all rules, they will bypass all the rules. And you can see there's so many stars on uh, these scanners. I think it's about like 12, uh, 15. We have 25. We have lots of uh, GitHub stars. Over here, it's a GitHub star that we are looking at. But we want, before, before we want more, I, I want, to, want to emphasize and talk about the scanner hijacking. So what have we done? We were able to alter the source code in a manner that we were able to manipulate and abuse how the scanner works, the scanner behavior itself. So if someone adds a file inside a repo and I'm running it, I'm able to tell him, no, everything is okay, just skip security. And Sometimes it's good that we can do it and sometimes we don't know about it and we don't have the proper visibility if someone really did it. Like I don't look at all the files out there in my 1000 repos inside my organization and start looking, did someone manipulate and abuse and uh, bypass my uh, scanners? Like this is not what I'm doing. And the scanners don't tell you, oh, someone uh, bypassed me Please check this. So it's a good place to think about and understand what we want to do with this for the future. But let's go, this is DEF CON, so I'm going into experiment number two. It is much more interesting. So I continue to look inside Chekhov and I saw there's external checks there. Now, there's a directory for custom checks to be loaded. And I like custom checks because custom checks means code so looking at the different what I can do so again I created a repo and I can clone it scan it it has check of YML inside I load the configuration and inside I tell it go to external checks or inside the directory checks now I control the clone I control the repo so I created a directory with checks with an init py and then inside I can create any Python file I want and it will load it. Like one check of will scan. It will first load my files and execute them. So now not only I'm able to bypass the configuration, I'm actually able to execute code inside the environment that the scanner is running. And let's see a demo about this, if we are in demos. So I created here, like I have my pipe dream, it's a, that is waiting for an event. I have a RC um, file over here, and I created a dot, dot check of YML file with uh, different runners. Inside the runner, it just creates, it calls the RCSH with check of. RCSH just sends something to my pipe dream. It's a wget or call, I don't remember. And as you see, when I, the moment I run Chekhov, I see a post, I got something from Chekhov. I even see it had a PyCache, it uh, compiled my, uh, my files, I saw it did stuff. So it's actually pretty cool. 
Now, with this command execution, I can execute, I can access environment variables, I can access different networks. I can, I'm actually running as the scanners themselves. So it's important. Experiment number three. Now I talked about Kibit before, about Clojure. Clojure is a very interesting language. It's very, very dynamic and very fun. And this is uh, for a, a bit of from the source code of uh, Kibit. And there's a read file, and this is how it reads the files themselves, the source code. It, it uses a function called read. Now, we have a warning inside the closure source code that you should not use closure code read or read string, which is weird because every developer, junior developer will try to read string and read data. Uh, from untrusted sources. So this means that the question is why? Like you, you may be asking why why is this warning? What read actually does is reads closure code and evaluates it. And then closure we have something called like a self-evaluating form. Um, I will get to it in the in later slide. But this is Kibit. Kibit is a static code analyze, analyzer. Uh, we, it takes some code, and uh, when you run it, you run it with line usually. It's line is like the NPM of uh, Clojure, and uh, you run it with line, and it tells you, okay, this is a problem. We'll consider using one instead of if. Uh, but then if you use a self-evaluating uh, form, that's hashtag equals something, this will actually run if you run it through a read the function. So I created again, I load different libraries because Clojure is very dynamic. I can load and everything I want. And I did a print line to a shell to run again the same RCE kibit and then shut down agents just to exit nicely. So we, I run it, line kibit, running code, and then I see the exit code, exit one, out success. I'm able to run my code. Experiment number four. We see we have pre-processing. So Robocop, for instance, has a configuration file that is very cool and very dynamic. And so dynamic, when it sees ERB templating, it, exec it executes it. So, and I saw in the documentation, yeah, let's do get status. So I just did run RC Robocop, exit, it worked. So the moment I load Robocop, it looks for dot Robocop YML, executes my codes and exit. Great success. Experiment number five. And this is a bit different than the others because I didn't find in PMD any way to have a configuration file, but it looks for so much environment variables. And one of the environment variables is uh, the Java opts. So you can tell it what options to give Java when running PMD. So I told him use jar, use uh, my jar instead of your jar. And and just uh, you can run an evil jar and it works and uh, you can load uh, another jar. But the question is how can I tell it the environment variable? So in some CI environments or in some areas, I know like even in all my ZSH, you can create a plugin that if you see a .env file, load it automatically. And so if I also submit a .env file, env file, env, Sometimes it will load the environment variables before running the scanner. So it's a good way to do stuff. I played with it, some did. Some, uh, uh, some areas I were able to put a dot .n file and it loaded the different environment, var environment var variables and they executed my code. So if I'm concluding and I have much more scanners in the pipeline to check and I have uh, different areas but this is 
a bit about the stuff that I talked about. We have Chekhov through the configuration file, Chekhov, PHP, Stan, and Robocop through the configuration file. We have Kibit through code. I can create code that will execute. <coughs> I have PMD and CDXGen and DepScan. I didn't talk about them, but same thing with environment variables. And I have more, uh, every time someone shows me now a static analyzer, I'm checking, can I, what's the configuration file? Does it have uh, some kind of uh, loading of the uh, rules? And um, more, more and more, uh, every day I'm finding more and more. So what Wikipedia says is correct. It doesn't actually execute the program of the static program, but it does execute programs. So I I am able to execute programs through different, we can call side channels uh, from the configuration or from other methods of the scanners themselves to be dynamic, but except Kibit that does execute programs, it's a anomaly, but all the others are really through the ecosystem, the framework that uh, we are using. So I'm saying like in, uh, your code will probably be able to execute other programs. And this is something we need to understand and know and live with. So the big question is what is the impact? If I'm looking at the impact and I'm trying to look at what's what did it uh, what it can do to my environment then i need to understand first where i'm running it so i can run static analysis in developer machines usually except if someone will do a git clone from untrusted sources and just load it into his idea or some other areas and and the security team automatically analyzes it or he decides to analyze it. This is a risk. We have security researchers. If I want to scan untrusted code, how do I do it? Because SAS may execute code and I don't want to execute code on my computer. But my environment and what I'm researching mainly in the last couple of months is the CI CD. So inside the CI CD, how does it work? So first of all, developers commit and push to de development branches. When you commit and push, lots of systems do CI checks on, the, on, the, on every push. And they do it in their internal cloud or in uh, Jenkins or in other CI environments, but they run different types of uh, testing uh, security testing on the code so we make sure that no no code will be inserted into production but maybe we can attack these systems themselves the next place is the pull request we have on every pull request and this is the request i want to merge this code into production we are doing lots of checks and lots of checks usually are also done against the production environment or against staging environments that have real credentials into areas. And lastly, we have merge into production. So the merge into production, we can merge from people that by mistake or by intention push directly into the master branch and through the pull request. But the same, we have to have the CI checks and then we need CD deployments to deployment. Now this gets tricky because sometimes companies forget to separate between the checks and the deployments or give too much permissions to the checks. Um, the implications over here. First of all, I can extract sensitive data. We had different attacks in the last couple of months that running code inside our CI CD environment extracted sensitive data and uh, like environment variables and different AWS keys and different even code and send them back home. If you have access to the internet, it's problematic. 
you can bypass protections. Uh, let's say we don't even have command execution, but we do have the configuration bypass. We can create like a policy to bypass the code to say skip security. I don't need them. I don't want them. They're just um, making it harder for me to deploy into production. We can infiltrate the network. We can go into use this as a stepping stone inside the network itself. Lots of red teams I've done. I played with uh, from one place inside the internal network. You can start end mapping. You can start going out uh, as an MP. You can do lots of stuff into other areas. Maybe every, maybe it's connected. And the last but most important, maybe you can deploy as to production. You can skip the CI checks. You can uh, force deployment through the CI and this is problematic assume code will execute this is my assumption and uh, we need to put around this code as much guards and lasers and boxes and sandboxes and different areas we can that eventually someone will find a way to execute code if it's from a very small open source SaaS tool to a very large commercial SaaS tool or some other things, like, let's say code coverage tools. I don't know. Someone can hack a code coverage tool, it can be awesome. Um, we can we assume the code will execute and if the code executes we, we need to be prepared to make sure that nobody that it can't do nothing and we know about it um a bit about before we i showed the the workflow the cicd workflow but in this attack flow i can add code execution to a scanner configuration file we can push new commits into the branch and then create a PR request. This is every user inside the organization can do it. Sometimes we can do it from the outside, even let's say in GitHub from folk. Actually GitHub fixed this problem or I don't know fixed, but made it much harder because now today new committers don't execute the workflow automatically. And this is uh, lots of attacks I've tried uh, got stopped uh, in this area. Um, but other areas are less, uh, less mature and uh, do execute code uh, if you push it to a dev branch or to a PR. But then one repo will be scanned by a scanner and the PR it will execute. Uh, this execution has access to our network and sometimes also it's the same network and same environment variables that the deployments and the and the CD deployments have. We can also just skip the whole check and tell the scanner all is good. Uh, continue on into production, even that we introduced very bad code practices, backdoors or whatever you want. A bit about high level possible resolutions. I don't want to go into much here, so I'll just print screen this. But uh, a bit the network protected, deny filters, uh, deny access to the outside, isolate only what you need uh, inside the host, the same, create containers and pods and run everything in the least permissions. And, um, verify everything is deleted sometimes if you have a pod that is running for 10 hours maybe it's a crypto mining maybe it's just stealing all your data monitor everything just monitor uh, everything that you can do and uh, look for malicious activity you, we need to understand the risks on running unverified code inside our laptop and inside our ci cd environments 
we we need to educate ourselves educate the organization educate our devops uh, and what's the best and how to do it properly do red teams on the cicd uh, we want to verify the tools we are running are good but we don't have enough resources to do it so we need to create a framework to check that how how we can ensure that the execution is running in the most secure way um, just ensure that uh, your scanners aren't doing any malicious stuff try to stick to SAST to static um, and deny any execution possible if you can make sure configuration is really picked up by your configuration hard code in the configuration lots of tools have an option to hard code the configuration to something specific so it won't pick up the default configuration files also environment variables unset them if you don't need them and the list goes on and on i think that security needs are getting bigger and bigger every day it's not only i think i see it like i uh, i see it and we are going into massive automation we're going into uh, devops deploying um, different production features every minutes seconds even and we have to be proactive and uh, understand the next generation of attackers and how they will abuse our infrastructure, our automations, how they will attack us from bef from side channels, from uh, internally, uh, abusing our just abusing uh, all our automation that we are doing in order to make our lives easier and uh, secure. It's also uh, have other static code analysis tools. It's not only security; it's also linters. It's also code coverage, it's testing frameworks. We have much more automations coming on. We need to deep dive and understand the different SaaS scanners. We want to analyze wrappers. Uh, let's say we have GitHub Actions. I didn't talk about it over here, but different GitHub Actions are wrapping our, our orbs, are wrapping our uh, scanners and creating it more difficult to add configuration files uh, to add uh, to it's more difficult to check if there is a configuration file or to run it securely we need to analyze them we need to create a standard for securely working with code analysis tools of any kind like i would want a standard not only for the output, like Sarif did, also for the input of how am I running security code tools? Uh, maybe do a SAST for executing security tools. I don't know, it's a bit meta. But we have much more to do. So, first of all, I want to thank you guys for coming to my presentation. And I want to thank all the open source developers out there for creating the awesome tools they are developing to uh, it's tons of work and we have millions uh, thousands of companies uh, working with uh, these tools and uh, you are helping them in so much ways i created a bit of a poc about what i talked about cicd lamb you can uh, check it out over here this uh, poc is uh, running is one scanned with different scan tools it's trying to execute them you can just pick it up try to use it don't attack nobody just do it for research purposes and uh, start to understand how how can you run it better uh, i started creating a community uh, i called it security tools defcon this link co goes to a slack but i want to start connecting between all the open source developers out there and I don't know anyone else that wants to join and start thinking about how can we standardize our tools how can we create better documentation and better 
uh, ways to make sure that when people are running our tools, they are doing it in the most secure way. Uh, so I want to raise awareness about this. Uh, you can you can uh, ping me up on, on the Twitter. You can uh, ping me up in the Slack. Um, I will be in DefCon. I will be going around. Just send me a message. Hey, let's meet. I have an idea. I want to talk. I will be happy to talk with you and um, uh, have a beer, go to a party. I don't know. Uh, just hang around. So thanks, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you at DEFCON.